we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have God in us. And He knows us because He made us just the way we are. So if you don't believe that, you're an unbeliever. I don't think we need to go over very much about the unbeliever. Remember the Jews that were cut from the olive tree where the believers were grafted in, the teaching about that. They were told that if they did not continue in unbelief, then they could be grafted back into the tree. But they were laying on the ground because they did not believe. Believing everything that Jesus took to the cross with him and accepting into our lives this fact is essential to total surrender to Jesus. When, he, when you know he knows everything about you and loves you anyway, <laughs> I mean, who could have a better friend than that? Or else we are saying that Jesus died for nothing. We cannot pick and choose anything about God. His rules and regulations or his love and grace and his forgiveness. There's nothing we can pick and choose about that. We accept the whole package and surrender to him. We have a, t we have a chance right now to overcome. This is what's so great about God. He lets us know all these things so we can have that opportunity. But there will be a time when there's no more opportunity. The proverbial phrase, the rubber meets the road, is no more applicable anywhere else in the Bible than in these few verses that we have today. Eternal life in God's kingdom requires a total belief, a dependence on Jesus Christ. We celebrate a holiday called Independence Day. Maybe that is our problem in this country. We strive for independence to the point that we cannot accept dependence on anyone or anything, including God in our hearts. We are so self-centered. Today we are studying about a day of dependence, a surrender to our King and Lord forever. It would be good for us today to get the magnifying glass out and examine as much as God will show us today what these verses really mean to us. So let's examine closely what chapter 21 is warning us about. Now I'm going to go thing by thing here, but, uh, t topic by topic. The cowardly, to start with. To fail here is to fail in the rest of the areas listed. It has nothing to do with the John Wayne image <laughs> or any of that stuff. These are not those who are faint-hearted in their faith or who sometimes doubt or question or get mad at God. This has nothing to do with that but those who turn back after once following God. He said, gee, it must take a lot to just stand back and say, I'm not following you anymore, God. No, those are cowards. The reason they're backing off is because they are not brave enough to stand up for Christ. That's why they're turning back. And they're turning back because they are not humble enough to accept his authority over their lives. That is a big problem. I, I keep saying this over and over again. In this country, the way we are pushing everyone, go, go, strive, strive, get ahead, be the best, you know, in our sports and all these things that we try to do, we are trying to make our kids powerful, more powerful, more powerful. How will they ever get to the place where they can accept an authority over their lives? If they win that game, they won't accept anything. They'll all be John Rockers, you know, whatever. Anyway, shouldn't throw that in there. The guy's getting humbled. They are put on the same list as the unbelieving, the corrupt, the murderers, the immoral, the idol, uh, idolaters, the liars, and those practicing magical arts. The cowardly, they fall under that whole thing. Okay, number two, the unbeliever. We've talked a lot about the unbeliever. I've said quite a bit because I got this out of Hebrews finally and late in my teaching is that, that if we don't put down guilt, then we said that Jesus died on the cross for nothing because he took guilt and nailed it to the cross. We should not feel guilt in ourselves for who we are or what we are. 
I went through the, the, most of my Christian life feeling guilty. I was thinking down in Las Vegas of uh, how large the church was down there and uh, how I, we, I sit here and play. But I, before I left, when I came up here, just before I left down there, I was able to do special music and stood up before several hundred people in the congregation, and that was a small group, and be able to sing that. But I was, I was thinking, I thought, why have I got a negative feeling about that? It's because I had so much guilt. I thought I was so unworthy to even be there or to stand on that stage. Or what do people think about me, you know? Uh, and I, guilt about be getting old, guilt about all kinds of things like that, you know? And I walked out of that church just coming, coming up into this area with so much guilt on my shoulders, I wonder I even continued on, you know? Where did I get that? It was from teaching. <laughs> No one ever told me, nail the guilt to the cross. No, we're not supposed to do that. When Jesus is in us, we are powerful. <laughs> when we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have God in us. And he knows us because he made us just the way we are. So if you don't believe that, you're an unbeliever. I don't think we need to go over very much about the unbeliever. Remember the Jews that were cut from the olive tree where the believers were grafted in, the teaching about that. They were told that if they did not continue in unbelief, then they could be grafted back into the tree. But they were laying on the ground because they did not believe. Believing everything that Jesus took to the cross with him and accepting into our lives this fact is essential to total surrender to Jesus. When, he, when you know he knows everything about you and loves you anyway, <laughs> I mean, who could have a better friend than that? Or else we are saying that Jesus died for nothing. We cannot pick and choose anything about God, his rules and regulations, or his love and grace and his forgiveness. There's nothing we can pick and choose about that. We accept the whole package and surrender to him. Three, vile. It says vile. This is where the word abominable, abominable, comes from. The Greek word was deluso. I wanted to sound a little bit like your dad. You know, throw in a Greek word now and then. <clears throat> Which meant, the Greek word deluso, it meant cause to stink. <laughs> That's interesting. A basic uh, meaning, but loathsome. Feel disgust. Detest have horror of. It refers to those polluted by unnatural lusts. They stink in the body of Christ. <laughs> you know, we see on the television sh shows like the Survivor series, I don't know if you've seen that, where people are forced to do things that are unnatural to them because of their situation. And they're kind of I challenge you, you know, these horrible worms that they were eating, you know. When, by association, we start to relate, say, well, I could do that. And then lust after that, which was unnatural to begin with, oh, I like worms now, you know. Or like what was once abominable to us, but not anymore. When we get to that point, watch out. If at one time this was something that was really bad, and you could not get near it, <clears throat> but now it doesn't bother you anymore, watch out. <laughs> You're starting. This is the trend of television entertainment now. Big Brother is following, etc., etc., etc. It used to be just the Halloween, and the Halloween 1 and 2 and 3, and, and some of those horror things, but those were stories that somebody wrote. wrote. Now we're getting into real life situations, things that we can really relate to in an unnatural way. Being exposed continually to something vile can eventually cause us to lust after it. It's sick, but it's true. And if we do not overcome it, we will fall into this category in Revelation 12, or uh, chapter 21. Okay, four, murderers. The Greek word used here is phonius. 
and means always, or at least intentional, homicide. I tried to stick my past ex uh, exception to this in this teaching here that stretched it to also mean spiritual murder, but it didn't work. But later I'll show you where that is. Because this is phonies. <laughs> this is homicide. This is first degree. This is where it is so good to always consult an exhaustive con concordance of Hebrew and Greek words used in the Bible translation. And that's what I went to to find this out. There was no getting away from it. Exhaustive concordance of Greek and Hebrew. And you can get one of those and get a little one if you want. Before you start telling everybody how much you know about the Bible, check out the words to see if it's really what you were taught, you know, if you're, or what you were taught was correct. Then there can be no doubt of what the writer was inspired by God to write, regardless of language or translation. You say, oh, I don't read that translation. Why? You know, just carry a concordance with you. You can get through it. And pray to the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit will guide you. If a murderer does not completely overcome his murder, then he goes to the second death. I'm going to say some things here that just your head is going to spin, <laughs> you know. But I was in the prison ministry for a long time, and I won't get into all that. So the murder completely overcome his murder. But Jay, you might say, how can someone bring back to life someone he has already killed? <laughs> you can't go and say, hey, wake up, guy. I've overcome. <laughs> this is where complete belief and total surrender to God comes in on behalf of the murderer. Not a lukewarm belief about what Jesus accomplishes for us on the cross, but a broken and repented spirit and a renewal that only comes with the renovation and making of all things new that comes from God. Do you think this world is, is any better than a, a, a murderer? <laughs> That's why God is renewing this entire world, the entire universe. He's renewing everything. There's a renovation going on. And do you think we're any better than a murderer? No, we're not. That's why we are renewed. And there's a renovation that goes on with us when we accept Jesus Christ. And we can't do it. God has to do the renovating. We'll build us the wrong way, you know. I am very much convinced that while many have paid their debt to society, and I saw a lot of them in prison, in the prison system, by their conversion, they were also no longer considered murderers by God. For society, they were still murderers because nobody will forgive them. But to God, they are forgiven because they have been renewed. They're not the same person. Okay, number five, the sexually immoral. That's where they got the name Las Vegas from. No, just kidding. <laughs> and second cousin Reno. But anyway, sexually immoral. The King James Version uh, calls it whoremongers. It's, it's, I, it's kind of better, whoremonger. I think it'd make a better title on a movie than sexually immoral. You know, I don't know, it might draw more people with sexually immoral in it. It is the same Greek word used in Ephesians 5.5 5, when it says immoral. It says sexually immoral, but it, immoral is the same word that we have here in uh, chapter 21. Ephesians 5.3, I'm going to start in 3. It says, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because they are improper for God's holy people. It's funny, and I've said this before, how many times we stop on sexually immoral, but it's listed here in Ephesians. Paul would say immoral, impurity, and greed, and probably... Most, most of the, our society have an equal amount of each because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity. It's, been, it's, it's very stylish now for Christians to say something obscene 
<laughs> it seems like, you know, you can get a good laugh out of that. I've been very guilty of these things. Foolish talk. There's my big one. Let's get real. Or coarse joking. Hey, have you heard this one? You know, Oh, you're a pastor. Oh, that's all right. Tell me. Which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving you should be doing. For of this you can be sure. Now here comes the immoral. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. See, that's why I say really break down the scriptures when you read them. Look at them. See what they throw in there. It says no immoral or impure or greedy person. And then it says such a man is an idolater. When did you ever compare idolatry with being sexually immoral or greedy or something? Yeah, well, greedy maybe. But you're idolizing something that isn't God is what, what it gets down to, you know? Is sex bad? No. There are situations when it is. <laughs> Particularly when it's taking the place of God in your life. Can a Christian... Okay, now we're going to go on some things here. Now really pay attention to what I'm saying because you're really... You may all get up and walk out. Can a Christian pose in the nude for Playboy magazine if she overcomes later? <laughs> well, we said if you overcome... So the, word, the, the key word is overcome. Whatever she's doing now, well, we won't get into all that. But there's been a lot of that. Okay, here's another one. Hang on to your hats. Can a gay Boy Scout leader who never participates in sexual abuse be a Christian? See, now you have to, to weigh these things. If he continues to overcome. In fact, probably have a higher place in the kingdom if that person would overcome. I'm just leaving these hang because it's just going to let you give me the, the material to think about and ponder about here and compare them to what we're reading about here in the Bible. Can a woman who is an unbeliever kill her unborn baby by abortion? Here's a big one. See, I'm really hitting them today. If we had a large church, it'd be very small the next week. This is the answer. It's the same. Murder and unbelief have the same pain. If she's an unbeliever, she kills her baby, she's going to the same place. <laughs> you see? If I'm a believer, even after then the past is washed away. That's what happens. And she is to live by God's principles from then on. That's why I keep saying when they come to me, well, are you going to march with us in the, uh, in the uh, you know, ban abortion march? That's not the issue to me. The issue is, let's go out and tell people, young girls, let's bring them in and help them have their baby and, then ex and let them know what, what Jesus has for them. And, uh, and maybe their lives can get turned around through all of that, you know? The Greek word for sexual immorality is pornos. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Probably where we get pornographic, I'm pretty sure. And here means immoral, fornicator, under which lies the homosexual abuser, is a fornicator just like a heterosexual, and adulterer, which is anything sexual outside of marriage. Sexual, physical, imp let's see, we can only hope to overcome these, this by being totally asexual, Physically impaired, <laughs> maybe that's the, the eunuch, or dead. Outside of that, our flesh really goes full steam in these areas, you know. But still God tells us that even if we think it, we're guilty. Boy, he really lays it on. You say, okay, God, I can keep away from all that. 
But I'm reading your mind and it stinks. <laughs> God gives us two ways. Only in marriage, but then let me throw this in there, covered, and even in the marriage, we're covered by belief of forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ for our vile thoughts. <laughs> Even married. If we're human, that's going to happen to a lot of people. And the second is abstinity. But even in abstinity, covered by belief of forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ for our thoughts and weaknesses. A continual life of repentance in the strength of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Those are rough. Marriage is rough. <laughs> Obstinity is rough. But these are the two that God has given us and, uh, in order to stay away from that area. And we can't do it. You know? God is the only one that can help us through that. I would like, and I've said this before, I do a lot of weddings. I'd like to be able to say that after I do a wedding, everything is fine. If you're married in the church or you're born again Christian, sold out for Jesus Christ, you've got no problems. But the statistics down at the courthouse says that 50 the same percentage of those people get divorced as the ones that are just in the world and could care less. So it's within each and every one. It's our own in individual desire to seek God, surrender to him. That's what the end of this, this book of Revelation is all about. It's a, it's a, a surrendering. Surrendering to your mate. No, surrendering to God so that he can help you get through this thing. Magical arts, this is the, uh, we're coming close to the end, and this is another hot one. This is what the NIV translate as those who practice magical arts. Practice magical arts, it says. I like that word practice. Maybe they're not doing it, they're just practicing. <laughs> yeah, I don't need a hair. Anyway, <laughs> doctors have a practice, and it is something they are continually learning from and using on others. So when it says practice, I have to look at it almost like a doctor, you know? Oh, this is good. This is really good for you. Here, let me help you. I'll give you a little bit now, and then later, if you like it, I'll give you some more. And I have some other things here that might help you get over this depression. You know, it's like practicing, you know? Magical arts. The King James Bible version calls it sorcery. <laughs> you remember uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, you know? The witch's brew, yeah. The Greek word again is pharmakias, out of pharmakia, meaning medication. That's what it means. It means medication, pharmacy. That's why, what we have up on our building when we going to sell medication. And pharma, pharmakon, meaning druggist or pharmacist. So uh, the pharmakon is practicing and using pharmakia or poisoner and by extension magician or sorcerer that's what this magical art is and I don't know how we can avoid the fact that I would say the, ba the baby boom generation has really pushed this thing along you know it's gotten so it's accepted so sorcerer here in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation falls under all of these categories. It appears that if we are mastered by any kind of drug where there is no possible possibility to overcome, that could be a prescription drug. It seems to me it says pharmacy, you know. Well, I take these pain pills. Well, I have to have these nerve pills. <laughs> take a nerve pill. <laughs> I can't do without him. Go get my pills and run it out. <laughs> and, and where one seeks to produce supernatural effects in the lives of others through enchantments and charms, take this pill and look at this crystal for a while. You're going to feel good. And I'll tell you your uh, horoscope. The outcome is eternal separation from God and the second death. There's no way out of it. That's looking in the, uh, for the Greek words and all that. So we're, these are all the biggies from the Bible. It's just all coming down and we're looking at all of them here. We come to idolaters. 
Whatever image we worship that takes the attention, love, and authority away from God is an idol. I don't care what it is. It can be your mother, it can be your husband or wife, it can be the pastor, it can be anything, your job, anything, Elvis Presley, whatever it is, it is taking the, your attention and your love and, and the authority, and it comes down to the authority away from God. You, you obey the authority of whatever that idol says more than you do God. It's all the way through the Old Testament. All of the Jews were tested on this, and they all failed. And so we're no different from that. And we become idolaters in that kind of worship. Just the act of this is related to the whoremongers that we were talking about, as we have seen, like abominable and immoral acts. All of these things are all related. Now the liars. A liar doesn't seem to be so bad, maybe more of an annoyance and undependability. You know, some, there, people lie to you all the time, you know? And you just pass it off. You figure, well, he's a liar. He doesn't, he doesn't say the truth all the time, so I'm not going to pay any attention to it. So we put it on the back burner. However, to God it is much more. That's why it's listed here. And it's in John 8, 42. It says, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and now I'm here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning. Now, here's where the spiritual murderer comes in. It's in context with the devil. The devil and his work, is, his whole purpose is to, to murder spiritually Christians and everybody else to keep them from eternity with God. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. You see why God hates a liar so much. Because he put up with the lies of Satan. Yet, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. That's... Look at liars. Or people that listen to them. People who are victorious endure to the end. That's the whole thing. Being victorious, you hear that word a lot? Overcome. This isn't to say to, that any one of us isn't going to have eternity in the most wonderful in the, in the most wonderful plan that has ever been that God has. We're, we're in an area here in this life, in this world, of just pre pre preparing for an eternity. <laughs> like we'd say, if we think, I said this last week, if we think that uh, what God did in the, as he created this world and universe was great. That was just the beginning. Now he's going to create an eternity for us. It's going to be so much better than this universe and this world and this life that we know and we hang on to so dearly. So we want to overcome the pitfalls of this life so that we can enter into that. They'll endure to the end. They will receive the blessings God has promised. They will eat from the tree of life. They will escape from the lake of fire, which is the second death. They will receive a special name. They will have authority over the nations. Their names are in the book of life. 
They will be a pillar in God's spiritual temple. They will sit with Christ on his throne. Those who can endure the testing and evil and remain faithful will be rewarded like this by God. So let's pray.